two and a half years, the most devastating war the world had ever known reached a stalemate, and the casualties on both sides were close on 12 million dead. To the Allies, the supreme warlord of Germany, Kaiser Wilhelm II, was portrayed as a foul monster, a living symbol of German aggression. In reality, he was a man older than his 59 years, tired and beaten by events which had escalated far beyond his ability to control. A sick, ailing Kaiser, whose grip upon his country's destiny was slipping rapidly through his fingers. He had made his supreme headquarters at the great country house of Pless. His chancellor, Bettmann Holweg, Field Marshal von Hindenburg, his chief of staff, General Ludendorff and Admiral von Holzendorf await his decisions on policy and strategy. Field Marshal. Your Imperial Majesty. General. Majesty. Admiral. Majesty. And Wittmann Holweg. Your Majesty. Well, what instructions do you have for me this time? With respect, sir, we are here to present to Your Majesty the present situation as we see it, and to seek Your Majesty's advice. I didn't want this war. I was not even responsible for its declaration. This war is decimating our youth, it's crippling our economy, our whole nation, gentlemen, is crying out for peace. Peace, Your Majesty, can only be achieved by absolute and complete victory. At the cost of how many more German soldiers' lives, General? We are fighting a war on two fronts, gentlemen. We have the enemy before us and at our rear. British blockade has us on the brink of starvation. There is a limit to which may push a nation, gentlemen. If this war is not soon ended, it will be the German people telling us what to do, not the other way around. As you are aware, Majesty, I have explored every possibility of a peaceful settlement of this war. Without success, the Allies have rejected our proposals out of hand. The Allies. I have one cousin who is King of England, another Tsar of Russia. You would have thought, wouldn't you, that between the three of us... I sometimes think that Nicky and George conspire against me. I tell you, gentlemen, if my grandmother was still alive today, she would never have allowed From a purely military point of view, Your Majesty, our armies and the enemies can hold their positions on the Western Front indefinitely. It is time we had a radical reappraisal of our strategy. Indeed. For with every day that passes, the enemy grows stronger by building up supplies, raw materials, food. Mm. Within six days, Majesty, I can have six flotillas of U-boats commanding the sea lanes of the North Atlantic. I give you my word, Majesty, that the German Navy will bring England to her knees within four months. And America into the war within four weeks. Possibly, Your Majesty. We must be prepared for that threat. You make all these proposals, gentlemen, but it is I who must accept responsibility for the final decisions. It's too much for any one man. With the utmost respect, you have not heard all our proposals. As Your Majesty rightly pointed out, we are fighting a war on two fronts. The Russian front must be eliminated. Do you think, Field Marshal, in the years that you were a general in the field and knew nothing of what was going on behind the scenes in the Wilhelmstrasse, that I was not conscious of that fact? We are all deeply sensible of your foresight, Majesty. 
With Russia out of the war, I can release 122 divisions from the east, more than doubling our strength on the Western Front and enabling us to mount a major offensive. Hey, Ludendorff, a breakthrough. Complete victory. But have I not, Chancellor, again and again tried to get my cousin Nicky to sign a separate peace treaty with the Central Powers? I have personally, in writing, guaranteed that every single German soldier will be taken from Russian soil in return for a guarantee of a separate peace. Now, you, you don't know my cousin, Field Marshal. is as stubborn as he is treacherous. With respect, Majesty. I am confident that there are other means of detaching Russia from her commitment to the Western Allies. In Russia, there are certain disruptive groups. Every week I hear the same thing. Russia is on the verge of a civil war. Her army is on the brink of mutiny. That we should try to win this war by encouraging a Bolshevik revolution in Russia is sheer insanity. If we should succeed, what then? We should have an armed Bolshevik nation on our doorstep. Out of an enemy, we would create a monster. If your Imperial Majesty will not make some decision, then an armies might well retire from the field before another drop of German blood is shed. We must either fight this war to win or sue for peace at any price. But I place the responsibility for this on your shoulders, gentlemen. Very well. Admiral, you may have your unrestrained submarine warfare and the day hostilities cease on the Eastern Front, Ludendorff. You may have your complete victory. What dreadful tea this is. Where does it come from nowadays? Aristocratic conspirators murdered Grigory Rasputin. His death was for Russia a sign of liberation. The dark shadow that has hung for too long over the imperial court has been removed. But the bright ray of enlightenment we had all hoped for has not fallen on this government. Those of us who pledged our faith to our Tsar and to our country when this war broke out are now almost lost in despair as we watch our economy crumbling and our soldiers at the front forced into defeat for want of food and ammunition. <laughs> this government has increasingly displayed its incompetence, its total contempt for this constituent assembly and its inability to govern in this most perilous hour. As leader, of the Democratic Liberal Party, and in the name of those millions whom this war has claimed, I demand that this cabinet be replaced yeah. by, men, by men who deserve the trust of the people. I am astounded at the mild-mannered politeness with which Deputy Malyukov addresses these buffoons. I will not be insulted in this manner, Mr. Koretsky. Deputy Malyukov demands the resignation of the government. I say that this assembly should demand the resignation of the man who put this government into office. Yeah. Well, Incompetence and corruption, one must always look to the top, for this government are but fleeting shadows. The country knows full well who sends them here. The one man who, by his disdain of any democratic form of government, for his refusal to institute any of the reforms for which this country so desperately cries out, his inability to defend this nation against our enemies has shown that he is clearly ill-suited to be called Tsar of all the Russians. Yeah. It is not only this government that should go, but the Tsar himself. Yeah. 
and his entire court of lackeys, toadies, and incompetence. If you will not listen to the voice of warning now, you will be faced with the facts. Look up! Look up at the distant flashes in the skies of Russia. This Tsar may believe that he has been ordained by God. Then let him be deposed by man. I say remove him. Remove the Tsar. Remove the Tsar. Remove the Tsar. Remove the Tsar. I most earnestly beg your majesty to reconsider. To leave the capital at this particular moment might readily be interpreted by many people as, well... Don't stutter, Alexander Dmitrievich. Well, as neglect of duty, majesty. Not that I, of course, nor any... My minister. duty at this moment is to my general staff. They're expecting me at headquarters, and tomorrow evening I shall be there. A few days delay, majesty. A week at the most. Until we can bring the situation under control. Unbelievable. Monstrous. Who is this lunatic Kerensky? A socialist, ma'am. Leader of the so-called Labour Group. We are having him watch day and night. Vulgar, coarse little man. This speech is open treason against the Imperial Crown and against the State. I am astonished, Alexander Dmitrievich, that you did not have him arrested on the spot. I fear your Majesty does not fully appreciate the mood of the Duma. I must confess at one moment, I was in fear of my own life. If this sort of speech continues to be tolerated, we shall all be in fear of our lives. It is not enough that the city is crawling with anarchists, Bolsheviks, traitors. Now we must tolerate this sort of behavior in the Duma. My dear, there's no need to become over emotional, I'm sure. Alexander Dmitrievich has the matter well in hand. I'm only thinking of you, Nicky. If anything should happen to you, there have been at least a dozen accounts of attempts upon my life in the foreign press this past month. I was even reported dead in one Swedish newspaper. I'm still here. You worry too much, Alex. Her Majesty's fears are not entirely without foundation, Your Majesty. Then you must deal with the situation as you see fit. You have the authority. If Your Majesty were prepared to... If Your Majesty were prepared to address the Duma, it would restore their confidence. Are you telling me that I must deserve their confidence? Isn't it rather they who should try to restore mine? It is a matter of diplomacy, Your Majesty. You must not allow yourself to be intimidated by a gaggle of petty bourgeois troublemakers. If our dear friend were alive, he would not have allowed this to happen. I sometimes wonder whether my people fully realize the terrible of responsibility I carry upon my shoulders. We must be grateful to Providence, Nicky, that he fits the back for the burden. Hmm. And yet you look so tired, my dearest. Well, it'll be quiet at headquarters away from all this. Perhaps the rest will do me good. It is ironic, Majesty, that it should be quieter at the front than it is here in the capital. Alexander Dmitrievich. I understand your concern for my welfare, but if matters are as bad as you say, then there's nothing to be gained by standing here and discussing it. You have the authority to act. I suggest you do so quickly. I will endeavor to do my best, Your Majesty. And you'll keep me informed of developments. Daily, Your Majesty. Very well. That is all, Alexander Dmitrievich. God go with you on your journey, Your Majesty. Good day, Your Majesty. Good day, ma'am.
Goodbye, my dear sweet Nikki. You look splendid. One day, one day, perhaps. Petrograd, a general strike exploded into riots as a starving population defied the police and the military in search of food. But the Tsar's government could no longer rely upon the troops of the imperial garrison. And as the soldiers began to fraternize, it became clear that the revolution was imminent. Lazarov, what is so important that you risk yourself down there? I need a police permit and a travel pass. Where for? Kronstadt and then on to Copenhagen. Oh, there'll be so many Russian revolutionaries in Copenhagen. It's important that I leave here tonight. Oh. Few riots in the streets and you can't wait to leave Russia to announce that the revolution has started. It'll come to nothing, as in 1905. What a pessimist you are. No, I'm a realist, comrade. <sighs> what name do you want on your pass this time? Brecht. Brecht? Yeah, I once knew. Uh, 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 good morning. Um, uh, good morning. Good morning. You look exhausted, my dear fellow. Uh, yes, I, uh, yes, I, I came. Uh, I came straight from from the boat. Well, sit down. Thank you. A drink? No, thank you. Will that be all, Herr Doctor? Oh, one minute. Uh, telegraph this to Dusseldorf immediately. Yes, of course. Why do you call yourself Brett now? Um. It seemed expedient to kill off Rothenstein. Life is odd, isn't it? I buy coal from the Germans and sell it to the Russians. Copper, tin, aluminium, iron, steel. German steel to make Russian guns to kill German soldiers. But the Germans must know what you're doing. This is a capitalist war, my dear Glasgow. The industrialists don't care who buys from them so long as they make a profit. That is what wars are all about, profit. The only thing the Germans don't know is that most of the profit I make here finds its way eventually into the hands of the Russian revolutionaries. Amusing, don't you think? I don't find anything about war amusing. I imagine you have news from Petrograd. Oh, yes. There are riots in the streets. The government will collapse. Kerensky has called for the abdication of the Tsar. God preserve us from middle-class intellectuals. So that means the war will go on. They have declared their policy to be one of relentless prosecution of the war. Did you know that for weeks now, German U-boats have been sinking every merchant vessel on site, neutral or otherwise? America will be in the war before April. So now, more than ever, the Kaiser must get Russia out of the war. It is his only hope. And do you know 
who the German Foreign Office is hoping will achieve that miracle? Me. Not the Imperial German Army, but Alexander Helfand. A socialist revolution in Russia has to happen. It must. And if a socialist revolution means an end to the war, then the German Foreign Office will finance it. It is only just, don't you think, that we should use capitalist money to finance a proletarian revolution. Comrade, I'm very tired. I haven't slept for three nights. I don't find your flippancy in these matters amusing. You take politics too seriously, my dear Glasgow. I've just come from a country where men and women are being shot are being shot for their politics. And you sit in this office, treating the whole thing like some grand game of chess. I was out in the streets carrying a red flag before you were born. I have been in and out of every prison in Germany. I have devoted my entire life to the socialist movement. One of the first requirements of a socialist revolution is a sense of humor. We are in a unique position, you and I, comrade. We hold the course of European history in our hands. You know, one day, the whole of Europe will be one vast socialist state. Russia, Germany, France, even England. But there will be one place where life will go on just as it always has done. Right here in Switzerland! But it won't happen in our lifetime. If you stay here any longer, Volodya, you'll become a bourgeois farmer and settle down breeding cows. I haven't spent... 30 years fighting for the revolution all over Europe in order to settle down in this miserable country. I was just making a joke. Have you read Kerensky's speech? I'm just doing so. The man is a lunatic. The socialist parties of the Allied powers would be failing in their patriotic duty to their respective countries were they in this present conflict to engage in any revolutionary activity which might jeopardize their country's efforts to continue the war against German imperialism. Any war undertaken by a capitalist government is imperialism. Hasn't the clown read any books? He is a lawyer. What on earth has got to do old Bronsky? Helene! It's... It's happened! At last! It's happened! At last! Come all the way from the station. The papers. Read. See what it says. I cannot believe it. After all the years, all these years. Well, old friend, now that it's happened, I don't know what to say. I'm like you. Revolution in Russia. You haven't read all this. The provisional government, consisting largely of the cadet party, and the Octoberist Liberals have passed a motion demanding the immediate abdication of the Tsar. And here, the Tsar ordered the immediate dissolution of the Duma, which had once replied by refusing to dissolve and proclaiming itself a constituent assembly, which is in effect tantamount to declaring a state of, of revolution. Workers 
have organized a Soviet of workers' deputies. A nine-day one that it cannot last. Deputies of soldiers and sailors' Soviets. Blackie, they will be shot. Blackie. Cossacks refuse to fire on demonstrators. Soldiers march with workers. Barricades in the streets. A crowd of 30,000 soldiers, workers and students assembled outside the Duma. Well, if the revolution in Russia has begun, what in the name of God are we doing in Switzerland? The Bolsheviks must immediately carry out propaganda and agitation, legal and illegal, for an international proletarian revolution and the conquest of power by the Soviet of workers' deputies. Comrade, see who has just arrived from there. Zinovia, Gregory. <laughs> Telegrams have been arriving all day from Germany, from America. Unbelievable. I cannot waste a moment. I cannot stay another minute in this accursed Switzerland. All soldiers' regiments in Petrograd have pleased themselves to support the revolution. Proto Popov has been arrested. <laughs> Continue. Spread out. Arouse new sections. Awake fresh initiatives from organizations in every layer. Prove to them that peace can only come with the armed Soviet of workers' deputies in power and the arming of the masses in the fight for peace, bread, and freedom. A comrade Glasgow. The Bolsheviks in Russia are not organized. The voice of the proletariat has not yet made itself heard in the land. If we are not there now to lead them, the revolution will be overwhelmed by the idiot Kretsky and his bunch of bourgeois bungalows. I tell you, we stand here, helpless and useless, congratulating ourselves on a revolution in which we are not even involved. No, that's not true, comrade. Our agitators are at work in the factories, organizing the soldiers. The Soviets revolution in... will not become a proletarian revolution until the entire bulk of the population, workers, peasants, soldiers, are shown that they have the power to make it so. Power, comrade. The power of two million people. Not a handful of middle-class intellectuals in one city. But if we are not there now, at this crucial hour in our country's history, Perhaps even in the history of the world, there will be no revolution. Ah, you will see. This little capitalist shake-up will crumble like a child's sandcastle. I cannot get out of Switzerland via Italy or France. The Allies would arrest us as traitors to their war effort. And if we try and cross the German frontier, we'll be arrested as enemy aliens. I must get there. I must. Comrade Lenin. It is possible that, that I have the answer. I do not know you. If we, if we could talk in private, comrade. Help hand. He's a profiteer and an adventurer. He makes money out of war, and now he seeks to profit by revolution. He's a scoundrel. I, I agree. I, I agree with you, comrade. But if his influence with the German Foreign Office can help to get you back to Russia, what does it matter where the money comes from? Well, it does to me. The end justifies the means. Look, to accept German help in getting to Russia would expose me to accusations of treason, of being an enemy agent. Could have the most serious repercussions. No, there must be another way. By aeroplane. Aeroplane? I could disguise myself. Use a false passport. Ah, there are a dozen ways. Oh, no. There is only one way. Through Germany. A help hand is on his way to Berlin now. If he can arrange matters... No! Your presence in Petrograd is vital. Would you have the Bolshevik Revolution led by men like Stalin and Chikit? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I expect a telegram tonight or tomorrow morning. I'll report to you as soon as I receive it. see this opportunity slipping through my fingers. Just 
slipping through my fingers. <laughs> Thank you, Volker. Now, would you read that over to me? You are hereby commanded to dispatch three cavalry squadrons and four infantry regiments and as many machine gun detachments as can be spared from the northern sector under the command of General Ivanov and selected loyal and trustworthy officers to march at once upon Petrograd to restore order in the capital and proclaim a state of martial law. Yes, good. You can dispatch it to General Alexeyev at the next station. With respect, Your Majesty, would it not be wiser to wait until you've discussed the matter with the Cabinet? I have no wish, Colonel, to arrive in Petrograd only to be arrested by a wild horde of drunken anarchists. Besides, I have my family to think of. The train's slowing down. Are we stopping? I will inquire, Your Majesty. General Ruski? I must insist on an audience with the Emperor at once. The matter is of the utmost gravity. General Ruski. Your Imperial Majesty. I'm here, Your Majesty, at the request of the delegates of the Duma and the Cabinet of Ministers of the Provisional Government. But I gave orders for the Duma to be dissolved three days ago. And the express command of General Alexeyev to request, in view of the gravity of the political situation and the imminent danger of civil war, that, that Your Majesty abdicate the throne immediately. Representatives from the Provisional Government will take the earliest opportunity to present Your Majesty with the necessary documents. I do not quite understand the position of a monarch who reigns but does not govern. I have sworn a duty before God to serve my country and accept responsibility for state affairs. If I agree to curtail or relegate that power, I may relinquish control over the country's affairs, but I cannot evade responsibility for them. even if I would wish it, even if I would wish it. I cannot see to your request. Then, sir, the Duma will not request, but demand. Excuse um
we pledge ourselves and our arms to our brothers, the workers, to defend the cause of the people. Long live the revolution! The Soviet of Workers' Deputies have elected me as leader of the Social Democratic Duma delegation and have instructed me to say that we support the provisional government entirely! Comrades, my name is Kerensky. I'm Minister for Justice in the Provisional Government. And in that capacity, I have already ordered the immediate release of all political prisoners. Good! And are prisoners in Siberia? Yes, and I have instructed that our comrade deputies and members of the Democratic faction should be returned from exile in Siberia with special honours. I base my activities on the will of the people. Do you trust me, comrades? Yes! yes. Because the future of Russia is in your hands. Long live the revolution! Long live the revolution! May I ask Comrade Kerensky whether the government is willing to abide by the decisions made by the Executive Committee of the Petrograd Soviet? At all times, comrade! Indeed. And are you aware, Comrade Kerensky, that at a meeting this afternoon of the Executive Committee, it was unanimously agreed that the army should submit only to the directions of the Soviets? Comrade, there must be a central constitutional government, even in a revolution. And that the soldier Soviets of the Pavlovsky Regiment, of the Volinsky Regiment, of the Litovsky, Finlansky and the Grenadiers have demanded that the government put an end to this war at once! Down with the war! No army can remain in idleness. The restoration of the fighting capacity of the Russian army and its assumption of an offensive against the enemy is the immediate and fundamental task of free Russia for the sake of the revolution. And in the name of democracy and liberty, this war must and will be won. Our own reports from Russia indicate that there is increasing disaffection with the war and that the Bolsheviks are demanding an end to hostilities. I've always assured you, Chancellor, that should the Bolsheviks come to power, Russia will be out of the war. Quite. But they are urgently in need of organizers and political agitators. And the most experienced of these are exiled abroad, mostly in Switzerland. Then the sooner they're in Russia, the better. The only problem is how. They will not be permitted to travel through Italy or France. The Allies are not likely to encourage a Bolshevik revolution. Then they must be transported through Germany. It is the only way, Chancellor. That, too, presents certain problems. In Majesty, I did not expect your... I'm sure you didn't, Bittman Holweg. And who is this? This is Dr. Helphunt, Majesty. Our principal contact with the Bolshevik revolutionaries in Russia. We were discussing means that... I am well aware of what you are discussing, Chancellor. I am not utterly without sources of information in my government. I assure your Majesty there was nothing secret in our discussion. It is a matter of transporting certain revolutionaries in Switzerland across Germany into Russia, Majesty, with Your Majesty's permission. Did you really imagine, Doctor, that we would willingly give our permission for the encouragement of a Bolshevik revolution in Russia? But uh, I had been given to understand, Majesty. We have no intention of building up a power which could one day destroy us. The Bolsheviks want only peace, Majesty. terms. That must be a matter for negotiation, Majesty. <laughs> Any peace treaty will not be signed on their terms. Of that you may be assured. I am confident that they are aware of that, Your Majesty. We shall drive a very hard bargain, Doctor. <laughs> 
one that even the Bolsheviks, however much they may desire peace, will find hard to swallow. Our interests in the wheat fields, the oil fields of Eastern Europe, are very ambitious. Their first consideration, Majesty, is peace. Without peace, there can be no revolution. I think you will find them willing to listen to reason. And these uh, Bolsheviks in Switzerland, by all accounts, an assorted lot, are they reliable? As far as I'm concerned, there is only one man that matters. He has been planning this revolution for 30 years. He is bitterly opposed to the war, and he has the support of the Bolsheviks, who, in turn, have many supporters in the army and navy. Do you think that he will agree to this suggestion? He is in a difficult position. Open support from the German government could politically be extremely embarrassing for him. But on the other hand, he is determined to return to Russia by any means he can. And secrecy is most important. It is imperative, Chancellor. And you, Dr. Elpant, what is your interest in this, this little plot? I am a socialist, Your Majesty. I will be happy to have played any part in bringing about a socialist revolution in Russia. A revolution which you hope will then spread all across Europe? That, I fear, Majesty, is only a matter of time. If the German military plight were not so serious, I would forbid any action of this kind. And I have your majesty's permission to proceed. With the greatest reluctance. I tell you, if this scheme of yours succeeds, Petr Holvey, it will become something which Germany one day will live to regret. The German minister in Bern has already made arrangements with the Swiss government for a German train to be made available at Bern. From there, it will cross the frontier at Godmadigan, carry on through Germany to Sassnitz on the Baltic. A German train across Germany. There's no other way, comrade. Now, the Germans have insisted on the following conditions. All luggage must be sealed, but there will be no uh, inspection of baggage, no passports, customs. No one will be permitted to leave uh, or board the train while it's traveling through Germany. Mm -hmm. Two German officers are to accompany the train to the end of German territory. Food will be provided, um, but there will be no... Uh, how many people in their conditions? Twenty. It is not enough. There must be at least forty. Comrade, I have spent all night with the minister in Bern agreeing to these details. Then you can go back to the minister in Bern and tell him that I insist on certain conditions too. When one is that there must be at least 40 persons on that train. But why? There are only 20 Bolsheviks. Think about the it. Emigres. The train load of Bolsheviks transported across enemy territory at German expense. It would destroy our political credibility or we would be shot for traitors as soon as we arrived in Russia. No. Everyone must participate in this plan. Mensheviks, Social Democrats, Bundists, everyone. You are right. You can further tell the minister in Bern that no names of anyone will be taken on this train, that we shall be assured extraterritorial rights through Germany, and there will be no propaganda use on this mission, in the press or in any other manner. If I hurry, I'll just catch the 10 o'clock train. Hmm. What happens if the Germans um, uh, don't accept your proposals? Then we'll find another way. Oh. Tell me, Nadja, am I doing the right thing? It is for you to decide. I don't know. Then you must hold a meeting. I never heard such a ludicrous suggestion. We will be branded as traitors by every newspaper in the world, except in Germany. The Germans have assured us. The that Germans have assured us. The Germans have assured us. The whole operation, the whole operation, will be conducted in complete secrecy. <laughs> ha 
A trainload of revolutionaries crossing enemy territory can be no secret, comrade. I must admit, I have already heard talk of it in the cafes. It will be the political scandal of the century. It will destroy all our chances of a successful revolution. Comrades, comrades. Arguing in this manner is neither democratic nor constructive. We have not heard Comrade Lenin's point of view. My point of view. I agree with everything that has been said. As you say, our enemies could make political capital out of this for years to come. Again, as you say, it could seriously prejudice our status with our comrades in Russia. Everything you say, I agree with. Then it's settled. We don't go. Well, isn't it agreed? Do you have an alternative suggestion, Comrade Mirkov? Hmm? Hmm? Do you want to eke out the rest of your days in this godforsaken country while our comrades in Russia struggle to bring about a revolution, perhaps being arrested or shot? Like look. How will you feel, Comrade Mirkov, three or four months from now, when the revolution has been wiped out by Kerensky and his bourgeoisie, the soldiers and sailors' deputies arrested, imprisoned, and all hopes of a true proletarian revolution destroyed? How will you feel? as you sit in the Café Central in Zurich and read about it in the Swiss newspapers. The provisional government has already granted amnesty to hundreds of Bolsheviks and revolutionaries. Now, if we had their permission... Permission? We will send a telegram to Kerensky. Dear Comrade Kerensky, the Central Committee for the Return of Russian Exiles in Switzerland kindly requests your permission to return to Russia in order that they may overthrow your provisional government. Mm. Comrades, we must build a revolution that will outlive any political slander that may be leveled at us. I agree with Comrade Zinoviev. We must accept this offer. We have no choice. Nothing matters but the revolution. Nothing. And without peace, there can be no revolution. And without us, there will be no revolution. You see, there is no alternative, Comrade. Believe me, I have thought about this very deeply, but there is no alternative. And time is running out. I beg you, think carefully, and you will agree. We have to accept. It's in one hour. Russia. 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 Lieutenant Ilyin, I've been instructed to remain with you until we reach Petrograd. What's... what's the position there, Lieutenant? This has been a long journey. We've had little news. It's a madhouse. Peasants and soldiers pouring in from all over the province in their thousands. Meetings and demonstrations on every street corner. The Torito Palace is bedlam. Workers and soldiers, deputies holding committee meetings in every room, even in the corridors. We Russians have a passion for holding meetings. 
When a people finds its voice for the first time, it has a lot to say. There's so many parties. Committees for this, committees for that. Subcommittees, delegations, deputations. And uh, what is your assessment of the political situation? What, what kind of reception shall we receive? I'm a soldier. I know nothing of politics. Petrograd! We're coming into Petrograd at last! Ah. For all we know, we shall be arrested as soon as we step off the train.